Everybody can get better at spontaneous speaking. Many of us feel we're either born with the gift of gab or we're not, but the reality is we can all get better. The top three things I would say that are actionable. One, you must, must, must have a goal for your communication. A goal provides you focus, purpose, and a way of assessing success. Number two, you have to leverage structure. We don't just list information. As I said, our brains are not wired for lists. So we need to put things in a structure. The structure everybody knows, and there are many of them, is problem, solution, benefit. And then the final piece of advice I would have is we really have to act to be engaging. We have to engage our audience. It's not enough just to share information. You have to pull them in. I believe attention is the most precious commodity we have in the world today. Our attention is constantly being pulled in different directions. Those are the three things. Have a go have a structure, make your, your information engaging. If you do that, things will go well. Welcome to Dr. Patty Ann's podcast. And today I have an incredible guest that I know you're going to hang on his every word. But before we go any further, make sure you like, comment, share, and most importantly, subscribe to this podcast. So I am talking really fast because our guest today is the author of a book that talks about whether you should talk fast or not, if you want to get what you want. So please let me welcome Matt Abrahams as our guest today. Welcome, Matt. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here with you and to have our conversation. I am so, so, so grateful. I And I, I love your work and everybody is going to love it when we're done if they don't already know about you because you are a thought leader in communication. But I want to ask, I want to start off with the question. And the question is, what is something that's happened to you, an experience that you had that most people don't know about, that most people cannot find out about if they Google, Google you or chat GPT you or read your bio in the Stanford professorship catalog that's shaped your career? Something that most people don't know about you that had a very profound influence on your career. So there are a couple of things that come to mind. Uh, the first, uh, the the first is an event I had when I was a fourteen year old boy. I was told by my high school English teacher that Which I was needed where? To... Where did you grow up? I, I grew up in, in a community called Saratoga in California. It's okay. um, it's a small little community nestled in the Silicon Valley. And I was told by my English teacher that I needed to give a presentation at a speech tournament coming up. Uh, I was a freshman. It was like the first day of class. Every teacher had to send one student. I was his student. I had prepared for a week to give a presentation. It was on the martial arts, something then and now I'm still uh, participate in. I was so nervous that I forgot to put on my special karate pants to start this talk. And I was starting with a karate kick. You can see where this is going. In front of parents of my friends, my friends, the girl I liked, I start a 10 minute presentation on martial arts with a karate kick. I ripped my pants from zipper to belt loop in that first 10 seconds. And in that moment, I am convinced I became very interested in how anxiety influences communication. And that's what I studied in graduate school. My first book was written on that. I help a lot of people trying to manage their anxiety. So I think that one cold early Saturday morning had a huge impact on my career uh, when I look back at it. Wow. Th thank you for sharing that. But I do have to follow up with, so what did you do? Well, so uh, my the, the teacher that was chaperoning the event happened to be in the room. Uh, she was a younger teacher. I think she drew the short straw and had to be there. She <laughs> threw me her fluorescent pink sweater. I remember it very vividly. Literally just threw it to me. I tied it around my waist and I kept going. And I actually did very well in that, that one round of competition because I think people thought that, wow, he just got through it. So that's phenomenal. So so I was actually rewarded for, for getting through it. But yeah, so I delivered the presentation with my, my teacher's sweater wrapped around my waist. Wow. So uh, you just shared so much about yourself, including how resilient you are because many 14 year olds would have just been a puddle on the floor. 
Like you were able to regroup, get back up there and do your speech and do well. That's incredible. Well, thank you. I, uh, I I don't know that it was resilience or sheer panic that led to that behavior, but it it certainly was a moment that is etched in my mind uh, w- without doubt. Oh well, th- well, thank you, thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm just curious, what were your parents there, or did you have to go? Home no, and- no, they were not there. No, my parents. Where did you go home and tell them? Oh, I, I told them exactly. But well, I came home with a trophy. And so I had to tell them that I won the trophy. And then I said, and a funny thing happened. And uh, they were very supportive. My, my parents were were always supportive of what I did. And uh, we all get a good chuckle out of it. Uh, my mother was mostly upset that I ripped the pants. <laughs> so uh, that, was, that was the bigger issue is now we had to go buy me a new pair of pants. So. Right, right, right. So Matt, I'm sure I'm not the first person that has told you this, but you have an incredible voice where you could be a radio personality or a TV personality. Is that true? You must be. Well, thank you. I have a face for, I have a face for radio. Um, (laughs) So I I host my own podcast and and people have told me they enjoy my voice, which I appreciate, but my father had such an amazing, deep, resonant voice. So when people say I have a nice voice, I think, no, I didn't. My father is the one who had the really nice voice, but thank you. I, I, I try to use my voice as best I can. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, so 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 that was the beginning of your very illustrious career, and I'm not saying that sarcastically. Um, as someone that does professional speaking and coaching and stuff, I'm always amazed when I hear that like public speaking is like the number one fear for most people. How do you understand that? Because I know I know you've spent your career helping people overcome that. So there must be some understanding as as to the origin of that fear. Well, so those of us who study this believe it's innate to being human. It's part of our DNA, if you will. And it it really boils down to and and traces back to our, our evolutionary past. You know, our human beings used to live in groups of about 150 people and your Price. relative status in that group mattered a lot. Mm-hmm. And so if I did anything that jeopardized my, my status, and when I say status, I'm not saying who drives the fancy car, who has the most social mm-hmm. media followers. I'm talking about life or death. If you had higher status, you got access to food, to shelter, to reproduction. And if you had low status, you didn't have any of those. So literally- I'm not life so sure was- it's all that different today, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, maybe. That's right. So anything that I would do, anything a, a person would do that would put their status at risk, like getting up in front of people. And if you do make a mistake or you don't communicate effectively, you could lower your status. So those of us who study it believe it's wired into who we are. That said, it doesn't mean we can't learn to manage it. Lots of fears and issues are, are wired into being human, and we can learn to manage those. So it is possible. Uh, I spend a lot of my time helping people learn to manage anxiety. And once you do, great things can happen. So we have to recognize that it's normal to be nervous speaking in front of others. Those of us who do it a lot and aren't as nervous can trace back our anxiety, perhaps to a time where we were more nervous. And there certainly are differences in people in terms of personality types and experiences that make us vary in our level of in- and intensity of anxiety. But most people report anxiety at some level. Interesting. So from a, from a, a neuroscience perspective, mm-hmm. have you heard that, and, and this is, I'm sure, a gross oversimplification, so I'm sure all your Stanford listeners are cringing at this description, <laughs> but um, if you looked at a functional MRI and you looked at a person that said they were nervous and anxious next to a person who said they're excited, mm-hmm. the imaging is exactly the same, or the same, and it has to do with how you label the feeling. Do you use that in your teaching at all? And if so, how? Because people will be taking notes, I'm sure. Absolutely. So you're you're citing work from my friend, uh, Allison Woods Brooks. She teaches at the Stanford of the East. She's at Harvard Business School. And she did uh, this initial Stanford research. of the East. Okay. Well, you know, you know we've, got, we've got our little fun. Uh, so she did this, uh, this very interesting research, which is that we the physiological, the, the human body has only one primary 
the arousal response. It's how we label that arousal response that matters. And when you you hear, oh my goodness, I have to give a speech tomorrow in front of a lot of people, uh, that triggers the arousal response. And we tend to label that as negative. Most people are like, Yay, how exciting I get to give a speech. Most people though, when something exciting happens, have that very same arousal effect, but they label it positively. So if I said, hey, you just won the lottery, same thing would happen to your body as if I said, hey, you have to give a speech, but with one, you feel really excited and one, you feel nervous. So the way we label it, it really matters. And in fact, Allison's research shows that not only do you feel less nervous when you do this, you actually perform better. So there's a lot of reasons to work on mindset shifts when it comes to anxiety. So Anybody listening, when you have an opportunity to give a presentation, contribute in a meeting, speak on a panel, remind yourself that there are lots of things to be excited about. You get to share your point of view. People have chosen to listen to you. It's a great opportunity, perhaps from a career perspective. So when you think about all the things that could be exciting about that event, it actually blunts the anxiety feeling and you're more likely to do better. So I think it is a wonderful technique, one of many techniques that we can use to manage our anxiety. Oh, that was great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. That was that was great. I'm going to use that if I may. Good, um, please. So I know you help people um, have a difficult conversation, have an impromptu impromptu conversation, like when we get caught, right? What do we say? How do we say it? What is the most difficult time you've had to pull on all your wisdom and knowledge? So a difficult time where I've had to be on the spot and respond. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it happens all the time, <laughs> just like right now. Uh, so there are many circumstances where I am asked uh, to really give my point of view or have to assert a, po a position. Uh, there was a time where I was uh, managing a team. I was an operator for about a decade. I ran learning and development for software companies. And I was told that my we were going through a reduction in force. People were getting laid off. And I was told that my team that I managed was safe, that nothing was going to happen because of, you know, our priorities, et cetera. And that was great. So I told my whole team, you know, we're safe. We're going to focus what we're doing is really important for the company. And of course, three days later, the call came in and said, no, no in fact, you do have to lay off a significant portion of this part of your team. That's literally and happening was, right now to people. Oh, lots of people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and it was a very difficult moment. It was a difficult moment not only to have to lay people off, it was a difficult moment to have to change the position that I had told people at the time I was telling them that what was true, the truth changed, I had to reveal it. That was a very, very difficult time. Uh, I was told by my boss that that uh, she would step in and do it because uh, I had been told one thing and the other. And I said, no, these are the people that I know and I want them to hear it from me. And as soon as I was done uh, with the deal, I quit because I didn't want to work for a company that uh, did what they did to me. But the point is. Because uh, they broke, they breached your trust. Good for they you. They did. Absolutely. And the way in which it was done, not only what was done, but the way in which it was done. But the point is that was. Well, a isn't it true? It's not what we say. It's how we say it. Well, absolutely. The way you okay. say something matters a tremendous amount. Yes. And so that's a circumstance that still sticks with me uh, after having gone through it uh, was not pleasant. Glad that uh, that I was able to do that. And it came from me instead of somebody else to, to tell the folks I, that worked for me, but not fun at all. And how was it received? Interestingly enough, in my new book, I write I write about this story. I, I guess it's part of my processing of it. Um, it turns out that that the folks, you know, they weren't happy, uh, but because of you know the way that we had conversations about it and the way I approached each person differently, uh, you know, they they certainly weren't pleased. But uh, afterwards, people thanked me. They said, "Thank you for for walking me through a very challenging circumstance. Thank you for." the time that I took with each of them. So it, it ended up being a positive interaction in a very negative situation, if that mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And mm -hmm. some of those people, thankfully, went on to do really amazing things. In some ways, uh, being let go freed them up to do some really, really cool, impactful things in terms of pro-social nature and in their own careers. So um, not that I feel good about it. I do feel good about the outcome that happened for them, mm -hmm. but certainly not the process that I went through. Well, you know, because it's a, that's a classic example of there's external circumstances that we can't control, that's but right. then how we react to them can change everything. 
And Absolutely. the people that had the growth mindset saw it as an opportunity as opposed mm-hmm. to the victim is it's victimization, which I think was sort of kind of in a, a state of today, which I think is really yucky feeling. That's the professional term, yucky feeling. Yucky feeling. Okay, that's good. I'm glad. I'm glad we've we've to clarify that from the, the east. term. Yes, 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 exactly. Very good. All right. Tell me what have you noticed? You're still teaching at Stanford now, right? I am. In fact, uh, I I just finished two classes before we got on this call. Okay. So tell me, what's the biggest shift in students, what they bring, either their assumptions or their mindset that they bring to your class about their understanding of communication that you have to undo? Oh, that I have to undo. So... um, the biggest challenge that I have with students is helping them understand that connection is really critical. A lot of communication, uh, not just with my students, but a lot of people has become very transactional. It's about getting something done. It's about doing it quickly, often in a mediated fashion through a device when important work of communication is also connection. You know, the the origin of the word communication means to make common, which implies we have to connect with somebody else. So I think a lot of work I do with my students and my consulting practices is really helping people connect, making sure their content is relevant and important for the audiences they're speaking to, making sure that they reflect that they're listening to the people that they're actually communicating with. So connection, I think, is one of the big things that that everybody can work on. And and in a lot of ways, societal trends are pushing us away from this connection. Uh, And and the connection I'm talking about is not like I have X number of followers on my social Mm -hmm. media. That's a different type of connection. I'm talking about feeling present, actually having a moment with somebody where you feel like you're sharing the same air, the sharing the same ideas, etc. That's the biggest thing I work on with people. It's interesting. Um, So John Maxwell, right, has said the number one goal of all communication is to connect first, followed by your message, right? And and it does seem, you know, it's what I find so amazing is that never before in the history of man have we had more ways to communicate with, Mm -hmm. and yet never before have we been so disconnected. Is this ironic? Certainly is, is, yes. It's so ironic. And I feel it's because we confuse um, not just being transactional, but we confuse conveying a message with a connection. And I think that that's, that's a challenge. And I think it also overlaps into our ability to communicate on a personal and a professional level, right? Like, and to have a real, and and you, intimate's probably not the right word for the workplace, but you do need to have relationships at work where you can trust somebody, where you say what you mean, you mean what you say, you can influence them. And of course you have, you, you to, to not, to have a life without intimate relationships personally is probably pretty sad. And I don't just mean sexual, I mean, intimate, close. Absolutely. It's very important to feel connected to others and to feel a sense of belonging. It makes a huge difference in well-being. And and I agree with you. It is ironic, highly ironic, that in a world where we have so many ways of connecting with people, that we actually feel disconnected. And where do you feel the challenge is greatest When you look at your students and the work that you do, do you feel it's on a personal level? Do you feel it's on a professional level? Where? I think it's everywhere. I think it's everywhere. I think, you know, people are are feeling a a, uh, sense of disconnection uh, all over the place. I think work is really challenging. Many people are are doing work in a hybrid or remote fashion. Uh, Not to say that that's impossible to have a good experience, but it's much harder uh, to to feel connected to those you work with when you just don't see them. So much of what happens in a workplace is 
It just happenstance. I'm in the, this place. You're in this place. We have a conversation, and we lose that opportunity when we when we are uh, remote. So I think it's significant in our work lives, but also in our personal lives. You know, people are more on their devices than they're in the presence of others. Everybody's rushing around. Uh, it takes time to connect, and we have to prioritize that connection. So I, I think it happens everywhere. Okay. So how do you impart? How do you get your students to do that? Uh, one is to, you know, to talk about the value of it. The other is to ask them to reflect on their relationships and see when and where in their lives they, they derive the value of belonging and connection. It's not that it's not like people aren't doing it. We're just not doing it a lot or to or as much as we could. So helping people reflect. And then, you know, in what I do, it's helping give them the skills to, to do it. So it's actually doing activities where we're teaching people how to listen better, how to, how to paraphrase, how to demonstrate concern. When it comes to crafting messages and content, it's making sure that that's relevant, that you think about what's important and needed by your audience. So there's a lot that we can do to help. So what you just said about, I was going to go with the listening, but then I, I just thought about what you said about crafting your message, right? You have to speak to your audience always. Yes. When you've lived your life like this and you haven't even looked up to see your audience, mm -hmm. I would imagine that since cell phones, and there's a lot of great that comes with it, right? But there's always collateral damage, unintended consequences. I feel like people don't know how to survey the landscape and to know what the audience is so they can craft their message. So what are some of the tips that you share that you could share with our audience now, because it, 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 you can be the most eloquent speaker, but if you're speaking to the wrong audience, it will be irrelevant, right? Absolutely. It is 100% important for audiences to uh, for speakers to tailor their messages for their audience. And we have to take the time to do reconnaissance, reflection, and research on our audience. We make so the, the three R's message. for the listeners out there. Did you hear yeah, that? The Say reconnaissance. That again. Reconnaissance, reflection, and research. So uh, the fatal mistake we make is we, we think about the concept from our own perspective. We suffer from the curse of knowledge and the curse of passion. We know our topics too well. We care about them too much. And what that means is when we're actually trying to communicate them to others, we can make assumptions, we can use jargon and acronyms, we can talk at a level that's inappropriate, either too technical or not technical enough. So we really have to think about our audiences and what's important to them. And once we have that information, then we begin to craft our content to be congruent with where our audience is at. So I might talk about the same topic, which I do all the time, but I adjust and adapt depending on who I am talking to and what their expectations are and what their background is. Can you so give an example of that? This, this oh, thing? absolutely. So very, okay. sure. Uh, I'm talking to you about the very same uh, topics that I research and teach my MBA students that, that I talk about with my colleagues who are other professors who research this. And I, while I'm talking about the same fundamental concepts, the way in which I talk about them, the depth in which I go with them, the examples that I use, all of that has to vary. We have to context and code switch when we are talking to different audiences. If we just have one message and deliver the same message in the same way, all the time, it doesn't help. It doesn't help our audiences. We have all been victimized by speakers or writers who are writing not for us. We get confused. We don't know the words. They talk about something at a level we're not ready to for. So you have to you have to take the time to adjust and adapt your messages. That's the critical part of communication. So for your MBA students, let's go with that. Yes. They're notorious for not being great communicators, right? Verbal. Oh, no, my, I, actually, I disagree. My students are excellent communicators. Well, that's because it's they're, stamped, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> so, right, but but they, they're learning to get better. Okay, so where is the challenge in general then? Let me just switch a little bit. Is it the written communication or is it the verbal communication? Well, I think everybody can get better at communication, period. But when people speak, you have an added layer of stress that that comes to people mm -hmm. because of the anxiety we talked about earlier, uh, because of some other social elements that happen when people are in a room or on a Zoom together. So I personally believe that the spoken communication for most people is more challenging than a written communication. 
uh, say, simply because you have these added layers of mm. the idiocy of the moment can cause a lot of yeah. stress. The nuances, the nuances. Absolutely. But, you know, you can write an email, shelve it, and then go back to it. Um, That's right. And, and you can always, uh, yeah, you can always make changes to it. You have lots of time. It's because of the immediacy of it that makes it really challenging. Do you feel that, how does the, how does the, um, the changing nuclear family impact people's ability to communicate in terms of the environment in which they, which they're raised, how that, right? Your first social laboratory is your family of origin. How has that changed that influences our ability to communicate? So did I touch a third rail there? No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, we are all we are mm -hmm. all creatures of uh, we're all the result of <laughs> our biology and mm -hmm. also the context and culture with in which we are raised. And to me, culture is not just country of origin. Culture can mean a lot of things. You know, my the, my family's culture and my wife's family culture very, very different in how they operate and how they communicate. In my family, I grew up in a family who where whoever spoke loudest and longest was heard the most. In my wife's family, everybody took turns and was very polite. And so you learn different ways of speaking. So when my wife met my family for the first time, she was like, do you guys even like each other? Because nobody's listening. And when I met her family, I almost fell asleep because, you know, they, they take so long to say something. So, yes, we absolutely are impacted by how we're raised, the genetics that we have, et cetera. That said, we can learn to adjust and adapt, and we must, and we can become more sensitive to the differences of those cultures and backgrounds and make adjustments uh, as needed. So just like everything else, we're influenced both by culture, context, and biology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what, what's the latest research on the neuroscience that's helped, helped you help others when it comes to communication? Because I'm fascinated. But like, you know, years ago, old school to say things like anxiety and emotion, you know, people would be like, ah, psycho babble, blah, blah, blah. But the uh -huh. neuroscience now, we can prove it, if you will. So how have you used that and incorporated it into, into your teaching where it's just easier for people maybe to get their arms around the concepts? Yeah, you know, I, I wish neuroscience had existed as it does today back when I was studying it because I certainly have been more interested I, I would have studied, I would have studied it but it didn't exist yeah, yeah. exactly that's exactly yeah. right. um so it, there are lots of things that neuroscience teaches that i i fold into what i teach so let me give you two examples uh, they both have to do with story storytelling uh what we know is that our brains and neuroscientists have found this to be true is that our brains are wired for story and if you think about it from an evolution perspective it makes a lot of sense before we had writing uh or anything of that nature the way we passed information along was through telling stories through through mythology and all of those things and so it's wired in us to receive stories so when we hear a story several things happen in our brain one we spin up lots of neural networks to to digest the story so it's it's as if our brains are hungry for it additionally we are we actually sync up our brain patterns our brain waves so if when you listen to a story my that i'm telling my brain pattern and your brain pattern sync up they become aligned mm -hmm. we see this in dance we see this in music and we see it in storytelling and these are all ways that actually bring connection mm -hmm. so neuroscience has really reinforced the power of story and how story can actually impact our lives and and i use that in my teaching to help people understand why we should tell stories and then how we can actually maximally create stories to take benefit of what neuroscience is telling us exists. Okay. So is it, is part of that, the, the listener can put themselves in the speaker's story and that's mm -hmm. where the alignment comes in? Uh, well, so yes, I mean, part of it's content, but part of it is just that our brains, when somebody tells a story, we just tend to sync up with them, the emotions that they're explaining, the way their voice, voice inflects, uh, but certainly there are things I can do to connect with you through using shared emotion and shared experience, using analogies, using emotive language. Those are all ways to tell stories 
to foster this connection even more. That's great. I love that. And I was actually um, reading the other day that music was actually a first form of communication. And music without the written word, like if you think about a drum beating, and that also was a form of storytelling. Do you incorporate music into your teaching with communication? Uh, I, I I don't. I'm very non-musical. Uh, Me too. I, I Me too. Music I, I sing music. in the shower. And even yeah, then, that's not I don't nice. even do that because people get yeah. upset. Um, uh, but the, the big thing that I, I use music as an example, I use it as an example in several ways. One, just like I said to you, as with music, stories allow us to align. People can literally get in sync. And you'll see that on a dance floor. People will move in, in, a, in a similar way. The other way, uh, I talk a lot about jazz music because a lot of what we do in our communication is spontaneous. It's not planned. You ask a question, I have to respond. You ask me for feedback, I need to respond. We're making small talk. This is all happening in real time in the moment. So I actually have to make adjustments, Just, but I'm not making crazy any adjustments. I'm actually following specific rules and patterns to help. Just like a jazz musician doesn't play random notes. They actually play regular chord progressions that they've learned. They just play them in novel ways. So I use music as a tool to help people understand concepts, but I certainly am not putting a soundtrack to the, the work I do. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, so I know your new book, Think Faster, Talk Smarter, you really want to talk about. So <laughs> what, are the, what is it that you want the three main takeaways you you want people to get from this book that they can that they can operationalize. Okay, so I'm going to give you the three things I want people to operationalize, but I'm going to give you. And by one. the way, by the way, Matt, that's such a classic podcast question. I never ask those, but for some reason, I just feel like I wanted to. I don't know why. Well, there you go. Um, so. Uh, that is that's great. I'm happy to be uh, the first person you you use a, a, tr a classic trope uh, for with podcasting. So before I give you my three, I want to say this: everybody can get better at spontaneous speaking. Many of us feel we're either born with the gift of gab or we're not. But the reality is, we can all get better. With that in mind, the top three things I would say that are actionable: one. You must, must, must have a goal for your communication. When you communicate, you should have a goal. A goal provides you focus, purpose, and a way of assessing success. A goal has three parts, information, emotion, and action. What do I want my audience to know? How do I want them to feel? And what do I want them to do? You must think that through before you speak because that helps you focus, it helps you prioritize, it helps you assess success. Many people just start talking not knowing what they're trying to achieve. So you should have a goal. Second, you should leverage structure. What, what to know, what you want your so audience it's, it's, to know. So it's what you want them to know, how you want them to feel, and what you want them to do as a result okay. of what it is you're communicating. It's actually Very the good. conversation trick too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so very important. Um, so that's that's number one. Number two, you have to leverage structure. We don't just list information. As I said, our uh, brains are not wired for lists. So we need to put things in a structure. The structure everybody knows, and there are many of them, is problem, solution, benefit. If you've ever watched a television ad, that's how they're structured. There's some issue, challenge, or problem. Here, the solution is the product or service that the company is, is selling, and then there's some benefit to it. So that's uh, that that's the way we struck. That's one example of a structure. And then the final piece of advice I would have is we really have to act uh, to be engaging. We have to engage our audience. It's not enough just to share information. You have to pull them in. I believe attention is the most precious commodity we have in the world today. Our attention is constantly being pulled in different directions. So when I communicate, I have to make my topic relevant. I have to make it engaging. So you actually focus on it and not your phone or not your friend. Mm -hmm. So those are the three things. Have a goal, have a structure, make your, your information engaging. If you do that, things will go well. Okay. So you're walking down the hall because old school, you have to be in the office and your boss pulls you aside impromptu and says, what are we doing about this problem? How do you operationalize what you just laid out beautifully in a nanosecond? 
Yeah. So it takes time. It takes time. And that's where thinking faster, talking smarter comes in. When I say think faster, I don't mean muddle your thoughts. Think faster is all about pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. So I know my boss. I know what's important to him or her. I've been in interactions before. So I am very quickly able to, when they ask for feedback in the moment, ascertain what my goal should be in this moment. I should be thinking, oh, it's a Wednesday. I know on Wednesdays, my boss always has to go in and talk to her boss. So in this moment, when she's asking for feedback, I should give her something that equips her to help her in what's coming next. So it's this pattern recognition that helps me think faster. Now, the talking smarter part is, okay, I know what I want her to know. I know what I want her to, how I want her to feel about it. And here's some things that she can do. That's the goal part. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to package this in a way that makes it easier for her to then take and pass on. You know, a lot, a lot of us don't realize that when I communicate something to you, you then need to turn around and communicate it to someone else. And if I can package it up nicely for you, it makes your job easier. And that's where structure comes in. And then I want to make sure that she's really focused and not thinking about the three other things. So I might provide some insight or, or some cues and clues for her to really focus on. So in the moment, I can do all of that again, because I've taken the time to think this through. The, the biggest counterintuitive notion in the work I do is that you can actually prepare to be spontaneous. And that sounds weird at first, but then when you think about it, you know, if I'm an athlete, that's all I do is I'm preparing to be spontaneous. I do a bunch of drills. Well, those those are reflexes though. Those uh, are reflexes. Well, how right? does something become a reflex? It becomes a reflex by practicing and working on it and getting feedback. The only way you get good at communication is the way you get good at anything. Repetition, yeah. reflection, and feedback. I got to put the reps in. I got to think about, is it working or not? I got to get other people's feedback. And after I do that for a while, it then becomes reflexive. And that's the goal. But you have to do that initial step of the uh, the, the work up that's front. Great. That, that, that is great. So this might be a, um, a, a question that's irrelevant. So you can just swat it away. Um, how does someone's level of emotional intelligence play into the ability to think faster and talk smarter? So individual differences in many ways, extroversion, emotional intelligence, whatever, certainly impacts it, right? And people vary in, the, in those degrees. Somebody who is emotionally intelligent will likely notice some nuance where somebody who is less emotionally intelligent might not notice the nuance. Let me give you an example. Let's say you and I come out of a meeting and you say, how do you think that went? Well, I might hear, oh, she wants feedback. And I itemize all the things that went well and all the things that went badly. Somebody who's listening better and might be a little more emotionally sensitive might say, you know what? She asked that question a little more quietly than usual. She exited the back door, not the front door. Maybe in this moment, what she wants is not feedback, but support and didn't know how to ask for support. So instead asked for feedback. So that emotionally intelligent person might see something that's very nuanced, that might in fact make a huge difference. Because when I itemize all the things you did wrong and you were looking for support, I'm actually damaging our relationship potentially. But had I really paid attention and noticed you wanted support and responded in a supportive way, I might've strengthened our relationship. So emotional intelligence, just like other personality or individual differences certainly plays a role, but it doesn't mean if you're not highly emotionally intelligent, you won't communicate well. Mm. It just means you might not have an advantage or you might have to work a little harder. Yeah, see, so that's interesting. I have to think about what you just shared because what I ask people very unsophisticated is, what's the real question? I, I might not know what it is, but sometimes I'll hear a question and it just feels like that's not what they really want to know. So what's the, <laughs> I'll just ask what's right. the no, real No, that's question. right. So, but you have an instinct there that based on your emotional intelligence that that might not be what the person was asking. A lot of people don't know that. Mm. Yeah, but what you said is much more sophisticated. <laughs> Let's just say I've said it before. Okay, with the with the under you're very humble with the understanding that you have a gazillion different personalities and communication is so nuanced. What do you find overall people have the most difficulty internalizing and then therefore bring it to fruition? When it comes to communication, uh, so there are several ways I could answer this. Uh, clearly, there's there's imposter syndrome and people not feeling mm -hmm. like their opinion is valid and and has a right to be shared. That's one track, right? And, so funny, and so I, I never I, even would have thought of that. That's so funny, but you're right. I never would have yeah. even thought of that as an answer. Yeah. 
Yeah, but but that, you know, and I think there are things that we can work on to help people to realize that, you know, in most situations, people want to hear from you. You're invited to speak. People want your opinions. We just get in our own head and say, I'm not worth it or what I have to say isn't as valuable as what others have to say. But the reality is you have value to bring and people want to hear it. You know, we we in our minds, we see everybody as judging like on America's Got Talent where they're going to give you bad news and rate you up and down shark tanks sort of thing. That's not it. Most people want to hear from you. They want support. We don't like awkward situations. So that's one way to answer that question is is, is that people just don't feel they have value to bring. They're they're they've got the imposter syndrome. Another big challenge that people face is their anxiety. And you have to learn to manage your anxiety and there are a whole bunch of tips and techniques you can do it. The one we talked about earlier from Allison reframing as excitement is one. There are many others. Um, and then finally, what people... about the psychological sigh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, so deep breathing is is a fantastic way. Yeah, explain it to the listeners to to manage anxiety. So, when you get nervous speaking in front of others, your body invokes fight or flight. Uh, you're you feel under threat when you're speaking in front of people, and we talk, talked about why from an evolutionary point of view that makes sense. So, your body's trying to protect itself. A deep belly breath of any type, like if you've ever done yoga or Tai Chi, you can call it the sigh, you can call it box breathing, whatever. Any type of deep breathing will help you. And what's key is the exhalation. The magic relaxation response happens during the exhale. It's not the inhale. So I like to joke the rule of thumb or the rule of lung is you want your exhale to be twice as long as your inhale. So if I take a three count in, I should take a six count out and that will help. So Deep breathing does a lot to invoke this relaxation response. Your heart rate slows down, your breathing slows down, uh, a whole bunch of neurochemicals that are initiating uh, the cascade of the anxiety symptoms slows down. So deep breathing is important to do. And you can do that before you enter the room. You only have to do it two or three times. You can do it before you unmute your mic in a virtual call. So there are lots of opportunities to calm ourselves down that can really help. Yeah, I tell people, Everybody goes to the bathroom and I always have to go to the bathroom before I speak. I say, if you go to the bathroom during the course of your day, do it in the bathroom. Like everybody goes, people say, I don't have time. I'm like, do you go to the bathroom? You have time. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. And, and the going to the bathroom part is your body being very smart, right? Again, it's evolutionary. Your body does several things, shuts down several systems when you're under threat. Going to the bathroom, it tries to evacuate everything you got. No, no sense carrying around excess baggage. Your salivary glands tighten up. You're not eating a meal. You don't need saliva. The problem is when you speak, it helps to have it. So we get dry mouth. We feel like we have to go to the bathroom. All of these things happen. They're very normal and natural. Taking a deep breath will help with some of those. Great, great. Okay, Matt, I could I could talk with you forever. Much to your chagrin, I'm I'm Thank sure. You. But but I want to be respectful. So I just have a couple of more questions. Sure, please. Um, one one is if I had a box in front of you okay. and it contained everything you've ever lost in your life. Ooh, okay. What would you first what would you reach in for first to get out and why? Does it have to be a thing? Nope, it does not. Oh, excellent. Uh, my grandfather. Um, I had a very special relationship with my grandfather, my mother's father. He was very special in my life. He passed away when I was five, and I would just love to be able to interact with him as an adult uh, rather than as a kid. He he had a fascinating life and I think could teach me so much. So that would be, it'd have to be a rather big box, but I would love to pull him out. Great, great. Thank you for sharing that. I, got, I, got, I can feel that. I can feel that from you. Thank you. Okay. I would like you to unabashedly promote yourself. Tell people <laughs> where you would like them to go to purchase your books, because we only talked yeah. about one, yes. um, and how they can learn more about you. Uh, I, I love the word unabashedly. So thank you. Uh, the single best thing to do is to go to my uh, website, mattabrahams.com, you'll find a whole bunch of free resources there. It talks about my books, my coaching, the podcast I host, all of that's there. If you're on LinkedIn, I'm a big user of LinkedIn, would love to be connected to you uh, and you know, keep the dialogue going. So thank you. So mattabrahams.com and LinkedIn are the two best ways to get in touch with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, so I suggest to my audience that you run 
to order this book, Think Faster, Talk Smarter. It will absolutely change all the relationships in your life, all for the better. And as Matt said earlier, who can't practice and who can't get better at communication? It changes the overall quality of your life. So thank you so much, Matt, for being a guest on our podcast today.